So we're continuing with the structure of the mass, and the mass, or the Eucharist, can be called either, contains two main parts uh, with accompanying rites. The two main parts are the word and the sacrament. Uh, Tertullian, who was a theologian, said there are, as he described it very early on in the church, he said there are readings from the scriptures, the chanting of psalms and the preaching. And this structure is very similar to what we have today in the Easter Vigil, with reading, chant, and a prayer, which also corresponds to the roles, the lector, or the one who reads, the cantor, the one who sings, and the priest and the books as well. So, while there are two main parts, there are a total of four parts to the Mass, or to the Eucharist. And those are the Entrance Rite, the Liturgy of the Word, the Liturgy of the Eucharist, and the Concluding Rite. The Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist are the two main parts with the accompanying Entrance Rite to introduce uh, the theme or the the aspect of the mystery of Christ's teaching in that particular day, and the concluding rite, which kind of wraps things up and sends people forth. So let's take a look at the entrance rite. What are the functions of the entrance rite? Well, you, the, the first thing you have in the entrance rite is the entrance song or the chant. And this serves as a way of introducing what particular aspect of the mystery of Jesus will be celebrated that day. There's an introduction by the priest, who also will do that in a spoken way. Then you have the penitential rite, which calls to mind uh, our own sinfulness, and really it's more gratitude for the mercy of God. In this portion, you have the, the second sung part of the Mass, which is called the Kyrie, and the Kyrie is Greek. We'll get into that a little bit more. After the Kyrie, you have the Gloria, which is an ancient hymn uh, based upon the Christmas song that the angels you uh, were singing uh, when Jesus was born. They go to the shepherds and they sing... Uh, Gloria in excelsis Deo et in terra pax hominibus bone voluntatis, or glory be to God on high and on earth, peace to people of goodwill. Um, if you remember the Christmas song, Angels We Have Heard on High, the refrain of that is the same text. Gloria. In excelsis Deo. Following the Gloria, we have the Collect. The Collect is uh, a prayer that the priest prays in the name of all the people. And the Collect is a Latin word, and it really refers to the fact that the priest invites everyone to pray. He'll say, let us pray. And then he has a moment of silence, allowing everyone in the church to pray silently. And then he says the prayer of the day. He's essentially collecting all of the silent prayers of the people um, into one prayer that the priest presents before God. Then we come to the Liturgy of the Word. The Liturgy of the Word uh, is structured, and of course this is the, one of the main parts of the liturgy. The first reading is taken from the Hebrew Scriptures, or what we would call the Old Testament. And there is a three-year cycle of readings for Sundays. Year A focuses on the Gospel of Matthew. Year B focuses on the Gospel of Mark. Year C, that would focus on... Who do you think? Luke, right. So, aren't there four Gospels? There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So where is John in this three-year cycle of readings? Well, John's Gospel is 
usually done during the season of Easter and on other feasts and holy days. So there's a difference between, if you have ever studied scripture, there's a, a, a little bit of a difference between the four Gospels. The three, what we call synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all kind of tell the same story in a very similar way. And we know from uh, evidence that Mark was the first Gospel that was written. It's also the shortest Gospel. And the Gospel of Matthew and Luke were both kind of based upon the Gospel of Mark. You'll see very similar stories in each of those three Gospels. John is different. John, his Gospel is more theological. And so the Gospel of John doesn't get a year in these three-year cycle of readings for Sundays. It gets spread out through the Easter season and other special feasts. So what's different about this three-year cycle of readings? This is a, a new development within the Catholic Church since the Second Vatican Council. Before the Second Vatican Council, the Church only had a one-year cycle of readings. And it didn't really expound upon the whole Bible. And so one of the things that the Council Fathers at the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, one of the things that they wanted to do was they wanted to open up the Word of God, the Bible, to Catholics more and more. And so they introduced this three-year cycle of readings for Sundays. It's a problem that will come up into when we get into the Gregorian chants, because the Gregorian chants were all written at a time when uh, there was only one year cycle of readings. So, and that has, that had been the practice of the Catholic Church for many, many centuries. So it's one of the things that we'll run into that might be a little bit of a, bit of a problem. So after the first reading uh, from the Hebrew Scriptures, or the Old Testament, we have the psalm. This is uh, a sung element, right? And it's sometimes called the gradual. And the, in Latin, they do call it the gradual. And it, it gets that name because the psalm used to be proclaimed on the steps leading up to the pulpit. And in Latin, the word for steps is gradus. So it used to be called the gradual. Well, it is called the gradual. But in English, we call it the responsorial psalm or the psalm. And this is taken from, mainly from the 150 psalms in the Book of Psalms. But sometimes they will also use a canticle from the Bible. The canticle, as we talked about in class, are one of those songs that come from another place, like the canticle of Mary or the canticle of Ruth um, in the Old Testament, or the canticle of Miriam, the canticle of Zechariah. But mostly they're the 150 psalms. After the psalm, then we have a second reading. And this is usually taken from the letters, or what we would call the epistles. Um, the letters are those things that, mainly, that Paul wrote to the different churches in the early church, like Corinthians, or Galatians, or the Romans. He's writing to a specific church. And here we have um, a new aspect after the Second Vatican Council. Um, in the, uh, before the Second Vatican Council, in the Old Rite, which you watched in the video, uh, the Trinity Rite, um, there was only one reading. Here we have two. We have one from Hebrew Scriptures and the Epistle. So this is a new development. Following the uh, Epistle, we have the gospel, but before we have the gospel, we have to sing, right? Because the gospel is so important. It gets its own acclamation, or what we call the Alleluia. And the Alleluia is sung all year long, except for during the season of Lent. It's the one thing during the season of Lent that is never sung, the Alleluia. And they replace it with other words. Um, but throughout the year, the gospel, the gospel is preceded by an acclamation. And you see this kind of honor given to uh, the Bible in the Jewish synagogue service, 
when the Torah is brought out, there's an acclamation, there's songs that are sung to it. And this goes back many, many centuries into the Old Testament. So after the gospel acclamation, or while the gospel acclamation is being sung, the gospel is taken out and is um, brought out in procession. And there's candles and incense, there can be. It doesn't always have to be. Um, and then the gospel is read. So let's talk about how these readings are chosen. The order in which. So uh, generally speaking, the church will choose the readings for a particular Sunday by choosing the gospel first. What aspect of Jesus' ministry will be focused on this particular day? So the gospel is chosen. Once the gospel is chosen, then the church looks for, well, what aspect of the gospel can we can we see in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures? So, first the gospel, and then the reading from Hebrew Scriptures is chosen. And then they'll choose the psalm based upon the Hebrew Scriptures. What is it about that reading from the Old Testament um, can we see in the psalms? And so then they'll choose the psalm. The reading from the epistles, or the letters of Paul, are kind of chosen differently um, during ordinary time. Uh, those readings are kind of based upon just like reading through a whole letter. So the church might start reading Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. And then uh, read that all the way through. And once that is read, then they will go on to another letter uh, and read that all the way through. So the gospel is chosen first, then the, he the reading from the Hebrew scriptures, and then the psalm, and then the, uh, the epistle. After the gospel, we have what's called a homily. The homily is not a sermon. So there's a difference between a homily and a sermon. A sermon, for any of those of you who might be Protestant, um, the homily is, or sorry, the sermon, a sermon is basically a topic that a preacher decides to preach upon. And it doesn't have to do anything with the gospel. But a homily is, has its inspiration from the gospel. And the homily's main purpose is to apply the teachings in the gospel to people's everyday lives. So the gospel, or the homily, is different from a sermon in that it will try to apply the teachings of Jesus that we've heard about in the gospel to our everyday lives. After the homily... We have the creed, another musical element, which is often not sung uh, in today's liturgy, but uh, before the Second Vatican Council was sung. The creed, or credo in Latin, is the long prayer that basically lays out all of the beliefs of the church in a very succinct manner. And the creed that is most often used in the Catholic Church is called the Nicene Creed. And it gets formulated at the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century. The Church can also use what's called the Apostles' Creed, which is an older creed um, and a much shorter creed. But most often, the Nicene Creed is used. Following the creed, we have the Prayer of the Faithful. This goes by many different names. Sometimes it's called the General Intercessions. Sometimes it's called the Universal Prayer. Uh, but most Catholics know it as the Prayer of the Faithful. And this lays out particular needs for a particular church in a particular place. So this is not determined by the, the church, the, the official church. It doesn't say you must pray these prayers. These are kind of made up by the local people in each particular church. So this is where you would pray for people who are sick in your church, or maybe somebody who has died in your church, or maybe you've had um, a local disaster, you know, and you want to pray for the victims of that disaster. So this is, the prayer of the faithful is very localized and very particular for that time and place. Then we come to the um, next most or the next um, main part of the liturgy, this is the most important part of the Mass. It's called the Liturgy of the Eucharist. And it begins with a preparation of the gifts. 
or what some people would call, in old times, we call it the offertory. Um, this is where uh, the gifts are, are brought forward, the gifts of bread and wine are brought forward, and often gifts of money are now brought forward because that's what the people offer uh, to the well-being of the entire church. So they'll take up a collection. The bread and wine is brought forward. And then after that, we begin the Great Eucharistic Prayer. This forms the central part of the Eucharist. It's sometimes called the Canon, um, which is a kind of a Latin term, which means the law. It's kind of the law of belief that we talked about before, the um, Lex Arandi. So this is called the Eucharistic Prayer. Again, Eucharist means Thanksgiving. So it's a great prayer of Thanksgiving. Following that prayer, we have the Communion Rite. And the communion rite consists of many different elements. It begins with the Lord's Prayer, um, or what we would call the Our Father. And then it goes into the sign of peace, where people exchange a sign of peace. Usually a handshake, or a hug, or a kiss. Um, and this has been a practice of the church for centuries, from the very beginning of the church. And even um, the people who are not Christians, they commented on the fact that these people were kissing one another so much. They're like, look, see how much they love one another. Um, in today's church, most people in the United States will shake hands at that moment, especially uh, with strangers. But um, certainly a kiss or a hug or anything is an acceptable sign of peace. After that, then we have the fraction rite, or what we call the unused day. This is when the bread is broken. The, the big uh, host or the the large piece of bread that the priest has consecrated will now be broken into parts to distribute to the people so that they can eat it. Uh, and while that's being done, the Agnus Dei is sung. The Agnus Dei is Latin for Lamb of God. We'll get more into that later. Then following the fraction right, we have a procession where people come forward to receive the bread and the wine, which now become the body and blood of Christ. And during that procession, uh, we have a song that is sung, or a chant that is chanted. Then after that, we have a prayer after communion. And then finally, you might have a hymn of thanksgiving, some kind of song to thank God for uh, the communion which has just taken place. In the United States, this is often not done. It's often done at the end of the Mass. So after... Uh, oh. So the canon, which forms the main part of the, um, the liturgy of the Eucharist, I just want to go into that a little bit. Um, you have a handout, which is the Eucharistic prayer number two, which you can see. But the canon consists of many different parts, and here you have um, all these different parts. So it's the, this prayer, this long prayer, forms the center and the summit of the whole celebration of the Mass. And here are the various parts. You don't need to know all these parts, but it gives you a breakdown on how um, this is put together. And you can see in the handout, the Eucharistic prayer number two, which is probably one of the earliest Eucharistic prayers that we have. Um, I believe Hippolytus is the man who wrote the, that prayer. Um, you can see all the different parts in it. The, there are a few sung elements within that. The Sanctus, number three on that list. Um, then down the list you see Memorial Acclamation. And then finally you see the Doxology. This whole thing can be sung, but certainly within it the people would sing the Sanctus, the Memorial Acclamation, and they would sing an Amen to the Doxology. So now let's go on with the fourth um, part of the Mass, which is called the Concluding Rite. And in the Concluding Rite, you might have announcements uh, for the church, uh, things are coming up, then you have a blessing, and then finally you have the dismissal. Uh, in Latin, it's ite misa est. And the, if you look at that, the second word, misa, is where the Mass gets its name. And it literally translated means, uh, you are sent. Um, 
in English we would render that as go, the mass is ended. Or the mass is ended, go in peace. Um, but it's ascending forth, and the people would respond, thanks be to God. So now we've gone through the different four parts of the mass. Let's look at some of the musical elements. There are two types of musical elements. We have what's called the ordinaries, and those five elements, the Kyrie, the Gloria, the Credo, the Sanctus, and the Auguste, the ordinary parts of the Mass are those things which stay the same for uh, each Mass. They don't vary, the text doesn't vary at all. Those words are all the same throughout the entire church year. Every time Mass is done, those same, those same words are used. So they're called the ordinaries because they're ordinarily used. The other type of um, musical element we have is called the propers. The propers are those things, those things which um, do change from mass to mass, from day to day to Sunday to Sunday. And those things will reflect upon the gospel and the readings that are, have been chosen for that particular day. So you have the introit, or we would call the entrance song or entrance chant. The gradual, which will reflect upon the readings of the day, this or the psalm. The Alleluia. Now the, the word Alleluia doesn't change, <laughs> but the verse which is sung does change from day to day and Sunday to Sunday. And then finally, uh, then you have the offertory, uh, which is the text which would accompany um, the bringing forth of the gifts, the preparation of the gifts. And then you have the communion. The communion song or chant is also something that changes from day to day, Sunday to Sunday. Now, this list kind of uses the old um, form of the Mass. In today's uh, liturgy, after Vatican II, you can include other things, other musical elements, like, for instance, the memorial acclamation or the great Amen. Those things are, are normally sung in today's Mass, or even the Lord's Prayer. Um, you could include also in the propers the prayer of the faithful, because that is certainly something that does change from day to day and Sunday to Sunday. So we're going to stop here. There's a little bit more to talk about, because I want to go through each one of the um, musical aspects, or the main musical aspects of the Mass, uh, but we'll do that in class. Thanks. <laughs>